great honor to be here for this occasion. It's a great civic occasion. Um, you know, I uh, find this to be, as Dr. Hodges indicated, extremely important, and it's important for me personally because right around the corner is the anniversary, the 176th anniversary this year of the tragic killing that took place at Goliad 176 years ago. I'm also glad to be here because uh, in the heart of Texas A&M University territory, because Texas A&M, the History Department at Texas A&M, along with the History Departments at the University of North Texas and Texas Christian University, have really done more than any other universities in Texas to sustain and energize the continuing study of Texas history. Uh, and especially here in uh, College Station, Professors uh, Walter Binger and Carlos Blanton. If you don't know those fellows, uh, you might want to look into, check into them because uh, they have written works about Texas history that have had national and international impact. And they are also mentioned in the bibliography of my book. Uh, those of you who are <coughs> fortunate enough to buy the book on the way in, uh, <laughs> it, it, at some point you begin to fade during this uh, this presentation, you can look at that bibliography. It starts on page 365, and it's about 20 pages, and it's, uh, it has a lot of the recent bibli uh, historiography, historical writing about Texas history, as well as hearkening back to some of the, the very oldest histories of Texas. I'm going to begin with what is uh, more or less a formal presentation that's going to last uh, maybe 20 minutes or so. And I want to uh, let you know that during part of this presentation, you may, have, you may have the impression that we don't know where we're going. And uh, I, I ask you to keep the faith because I'm going to kind of approach this in a little bit of a roundabout way. And I'm not only going to talk about my novel, uh, The Edge of Freedom, a fact-based novel, Texas Revolution, but I'm going to talk about more broadly about the relationship of the Goliad and the Alamo in tandem, how they affected our state's history and how thinking about them maybe in a somewhat different way might uh, create a little more interest and a little more, um, a different aspect, a different slant on the Texas Revolution. So this talk today is going to be about my novel but um, we need to use that preposition about carefully because it's really more of a, of a touchstone, the novel itself is, to discuss uh, the process of writing the novel, uh, the sense of discovery that's so much a part of the writing process, and especially for me in writing this novel. And finally, about, uh, uh, I'll be talking about some thoughts on what lay beneath the turbulent currents of the Texas Revolution, and there were many, many turbulent currents that lay beneath that. First of all, let me talk about the process of writing. The Presidio La Bahia has been one of the most important places in my life, and uh, I grew up in Waco, and about 30 years ago, I started taking my then young family, I now have nine grandchildren, so this that's how long this has been going on. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we went to, to the coast uh, every year just about for vacation. And so when we would take the route that went through Goliad on Highway 183, uh, I would go by, first time or two, I think I might have even gone by the Presidio La Bahia and not quite realized where, that I was there because, you know, when you have young children in the car, you have a tendency to sort of be focused on your destination and uh, or the next place to eat. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, you know, I, uh, after a few trips, I found that I really had to stop. And I had completed a master's degree in history at the University of Texas at Austin, and I had thought that I might want to join uh, Dr. Hobbs and others in the ranks of professoriate, but unfortunately, I think he was probably a lot wiser about his field. Uh, in American history at that time, we were told in graduate school that there were more uh, students in the history department at UCLA than there were jobs in the United States of America. <laughs> and I wasn't at UCLA. <laughs> so uh, anyway, 
I decided to move along and do several other things, and some of that has part. But I'd written a master's paper on Texas history. So after spending some time at the Presidio in Goliad, I began to sense a little bit of the mystery and the magic of that place, and I talked to a, a woman uh, uh, earlier about some experiences that she's had at Goliad, and I, I remember going through the part of the Presidio that was thought to have been the headquarters of the commanding officer, Colonel James Fannin. And when I went through that room the first time, I was thinking about James Fannin, the commander at Goliad, and James Bonham, the famous courier from the Alamo, having a conversation in that room. And I just wanted, I, I found myself really wanting to know what those two gentlemen had to say to each other. And the more I thought about it, the more I became really interested in Goliad and, uh, and going deeply into the history of the Revolution. And so uh, I, I wanted to know the answer to that question. And what I didn't know was that in trying to answer a question in my mind, my curiosity about what they might have said, that I was going to uh, spawn a lot of other questions. And, uh, and what I certainly didn't know is is that answering that question and others is going to take me the better part of 30 years from the time I started thinking about it and researching it and working on the novel uh, and of which there were several versions. So while writing, trying to write and ultimately writing the scenes about the long debate that I imagine occurred between Fannin and James Bonham, I began to sense or see that I was seeing, instead of seeing the revolution in Goliad strictly from the perspective and the lens of the Alamo, that I was beginning to see the Alamo sort of from the perspective of other parts of the revolution, and especially from the perspective of some of the people at, at Goliad. And then I began to feel that in this relationship between Alamo and Goliad, and to me this is really kind of the central, uh, it's the central idea, I guess, of the novel, this relationship between the Alamo and Goliad, I, I began to, to feel that I could see a sort of fading of one historical age and maybe just a few hints that a, of a different age and one that was somewhat more similar to the, to the modern era that we inhabit now. And so what I came, what I, what I believe is, is that the Alamo was a signal event, a major event, even if it may be a defining event of the age of Romanticism. And I will tell you that I don't mean hearts and flowers when I use that term age of Romanticism, and I hope that you will bear with me as I, as I wander through these uh, uh, well, as we used to say around Waco, pig trails of uh, <laughs> some of the ideas. Some of the ideas that I've had about this: uh, the age of Romanticism was a time when uh, passion and idealism seemed to uh, override the previous age of reason or the Enlightenment, the age of the Declaration of Independence, the age of the Founding Fathers. Those were people. Those were men of the age of reason primarily. Well, the succeeding era is known as the age of Romanticism. And Romantics, and some of you may remember, pleasantly or not pleasantly, when you were in school and somebody said, you need to read Lord Byron or you need to read William Wordsworth or you need to read Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Those were the Romantic poets and they were part of the age of Romanticism. And Lord Byron, for example, a very famous poet, he was caught up in the spirit of the age, but in his case, his great cause was freedom of the, of the Greek nation versus the oppression that the Greeks were having to endure under the Ottoman Turks, and that was his cause. Well, Americans at that time saw the fight in Texas as a chance to share in the glory of their forefathers who had fought in many cases in the war, in the American Revolution, or the War of 1812, or both. And that was a very big stamp on their mindset. A lot of the men of this Romantic period 
that was a, a, a major component. Their forebears had had this meaningful experience fighting in these wars of, to, to establish and maintain the United States of America. And so a lot of these people, a lot of these Americans that came to Texas or that were already colonists, they may have been in some cases, as most of you know, motivated by adventure or greed or whatever you want to say about them. But they could also claim in the spirit of the age, or they could also think of themselves as being chivalrous warriors, knights in the cause of freedom, disdainful of risk in reality. That was not, a, the whole romantic idea was is that, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead sort of a thing. And as I've already said, this romanticism that I'm talking about is not, has nothing to do with hearts and flowers. It's, it was a, in some ways, a defiant reaction to the age of reason. And in particular, I'm talking about a strain of Southern Romanticism, Southern Romanticism, and that is what I think is so important to try and understand the Texas Revolution. Try to get past the idea that maybe Romanticism doesn't make sense when you're talking about revolution, but this is not, this is again a, an age, a mode of thought. It doesn't, it doesn't really imply pure romance. The Southern Romanticism that I'm talking about here is, was, and, and it still is in some ways, characterized by a, especially though in the early 19th century, characterized by a chivalrous devotion, and chivalrous and chivalry are, are terms, those are words that were in cur very current in the early 19th century South. Chivalry was not a word that was cast out and seemed to be anachronistic. It was a word, it was a current word of that time. These people had a chivalrous devotion to heroic achievement, to fame and glory, and they had an idea of women, an idea of women. And I'm going to come back to this as an example of one of the trails I was talking about. I'm going to talk more about women in this regard later and in relation to Goliad, which may strike you as being, at this point, being a little unusual. These people were also devoted to an idealized past, one that was in the, in the distant past, that one that, that helped them to feel more comfortable in trying to maintain a static way of life in the South. But one part of this was is that this code of honor would allow, would not allow most men to brook any sort of insult or challenge. And even, even a mild affront could turn into a very violent occasion or, or it could turn into an actual more formal, even on the frontier kind of duel. And in those cases, and this is sort of the idea of the duel sort of shows the few paces, imagine the few paces between the dueling parties. There's not very much room between the dueling parties. And the only middle ground between those people is the distance that that bullet's going to travel. I mean, there's not, it's not an area of compromise. It's an area where bullets are flying. And, uh, and so... That's sort of how it was. It was, it was, you know, the all or nothing idea of the Southern Romanticism. And I don't think, I don't think the influence of the Southern Romanticism has been studied and appreciated as, as it should. So I'm going to, as you've already probably noticed, I'm going to display my own Southernness, Southern heritage and I'm gonna gallop forward in the chivalrous manner that I have hinted at. <laughs> and I'm gonna to try to make this point that in fact, Southern Romanticism did have a lot to do with the mindset of the people involved in the Texas Revolution. Now, there are scholars who have written very well and very insightfully about what I'm going to discuss. Uh, one of them is the late Rollin G. Osterweiss of Yale if you want to look into this, I just I won't go into I won't mention a lot of scholars here, but uh, and the other is a, a retired scholar named Bertram Wyatt Brown, 
And they both wrote about honor, violence, romanticism, nationalism, and the Old South, the first part of the 19th century where when all of the people in the revolution were growing into maturity and expressing their sensibilities often through warfare. The term code of honor to me is the best description for this sort of manly version of Southern Romanticism. Uh, although one of the historians refers to it as a rule of honor, and in some ways I think it was taken to be more of a rule than a code. I mean, it was so, such a powerful, had such a powerful influence, uh, especially on men in the, in the Old South. And within that code, again, there was a cult of chivalry, the glorification of military valor, the adoration of the hero, and once again, the enshrinement of Southern women. And women are going to come up again here in connection with Goliad. Why was the South, why was the South receptive to this particular code of honor? Well, for one thing, the South was, and it probably still is, a more physical part of the country. Uh, you know, the physicality and physical ability maybe is still more honored and appreciated in the South. Uh, you know, football, for example, football in Texas, football in the, I mean, you look at the Southeastern Conference, you know, it's, and that's the old Deep South. So, I mean, it's still, it's still there. It's still with us. It's, I know it was with the, uh, People my age, when growing up in Waco, Texas, it was still very much there. I, unfortunately for me, in some cases, but uh, it was it was still very much present. Now, in the early 19th century, it is true that people in the North also had to to do a lot of hard physical labor, and some of that, yes, was on farms, but increasingly a lot of that work that they were doing was in cramped and dingy factory settings and uh, in urban situations rather than the outdoor work, the hard farm work, uh, plantation work and so forth that occurred in the South. So in the South, so much of life was centered on the outside world, planting and harvesting, hunting, fishing, racing horses, forming militias to fight the Creeks and the Cherokee Indians on the frontier and even closer to some of the significant settlements and to put down actual or feared slave rebellions. The militia, the martial spirit was extremely strong in the South, it, beginning even before the American Revolution, drawing strength from that great battle, the great fight of the American Revolution, and carrying forward because the Southern frontier still had posed threats that reinforced this martial spirit and it was heroic military action above all things that could bring fame and glory and the most fulfilling form of honor. Honor is a key word here in chivalry, but honor is the key word in this presentation, in this discussion. It, military action was the key form that men could fulfill the deepest sense of honor in that society and culture. It was also significantly a way that men whose, say, brothers and dads and all this were the ones who were going to inherit. You know, they were going to inherit the property, so what am I gonna do? I happen to be a second son myself, so what was I gonna do? Well, in the, in the South, being, being in the militia, being in the military was a way, was a way for, the, for them to have an honorable occupation and, and be considered full, powerful members of society without going into plantation society necessarily or without becoming, say, a firebrand politician. It was an avenue for advancement. It was an expression and a validation of honor as well. Now, as the issue of slavery became more of a wedge between the sections, between the North and the South, a lot of people in the South felt that they had to find ways to justify slavery, call, and, and some referred to it as a positive good. And a major apologist for slavery argued that not only was it a positive good for slaves, who he claimed were incapable of independent living, but it was also, he believed, 
the key to honoring Southern women. And this fellow's name was William Dew of the co uh, College of William and Mary. He said, quote, we behold the marked effects of slavery on the condition of our women. We find, her, we find them at once elevated, clothed with all their charms, mingling with and directing the society to which they belong. No longer the slaves, but now the equal and idol of man. Now, thus was slavery presented as emancipating a white Southern woman. According to the Reverend Day, of course, most white Southern women did not live in households that owned slaves. In fact, women were not the equals of men and uh, were idols mostly when men needed something to fight over and, and were expected to use their, their real or their imagined leisure to instill in their sons the very code of honor that men cherished. The Reverend Day's torturous justification of slavery had the effect then of equating Southern womanhood with the survival of slavery. And to denounce slavery was to denounce womanhood. So if you defended one, you defended the other. And what could be more honorable than defending woman from the standpoint, from this standpoint, way of looking at things? And Sir Walter Scott was thought to, Mark Twain said Sir Walter Scott should be blamed for starting the Civil War <laughs> because his novels became, his novel, especially Ivanhoe, published in 1820, became such a powerful influence in the South and the idea of chivalry, of course, in part came from that novel. And that novel did have everything, it did have everything. You know, it had the woman under duress, it had the chivalrous knight, it had the heroic action, it had the glory. It had all of these things rolled up into one. So that was an important impact on this. So let me just cut to the chase here, finally. So after wandering through the weeds of Southern intellectual history, and I'm done with that now, um, what you may well ask at this point, does all this have to do with Goliad and the Alamo? And, and, I, and I can't blame you for that. <laughs> so I'm going to try to, I'm going to make a little, little, little leap right here by way of transition. I want to tell you first a story about Sam Houston. Although Sam Houston is not a part of my novel, although he's mentioned in the, in the bibliography and in the, in the afterward section where I talk about what happened to all the people in the novel in real life after the action of the novel was over. There's a long section about that. He's, he's not a, he is, of course, mentioned in, in the novel in different ways, but he's not a major character. But I want to tell you this story about him because it's, this is all a part of what I'm trying to say. It illustrates some of what I'm trying to say. Sam Houston was born in Virginia. And when he was 19 years, and that was also a very big thing in the South. If you were a Virginian, you were, you had a leg up as far as making a claim to honor or chivalry if you were a Virginian. Well, Sam Houston, at 19, in 1812, decided, some of you probably know this story, decided uh, that he had to go to the fight in the War of 1812. This is, again, some of what I was saying earlier. These people felt uh, they, were, they were, in a way, itching for an opportunity to, sh to share in the glory and the purpose and the honor of their forebears. So here comes the War of 1812. Sam Houston's 19 years old, and as a mostly self-educated young man, Sam Houston was famously devoted to the Greek poet Homer, and he was especially devoted to Homer's Iliad about the Trojan War. That, that epic poem was a, had a profound effect on Sam Houston his whole life. He decided, partly under the influence of being a Virginian, partly from reading Homer, I do not want to be on the sidelines of history because he was, after all, he was Sam Houston even though he was 19. I don't only want to read about larger than life characters, I want to be 
a larger than life character. And I think probably we can all agree that <laughs> ultimately uh, he succeeded. So he told his mother about his plans to fight in the War of 1812. Now, nowadays, we think about the often very tragic situations of people involved in, in wars that may or may not be all that we would want them to be and so on. But this illustrates the time that I'm talking about. So he told his mother he wanted to fight in the war, and for the rest of his life, he was very fond of telling any and all people the story of what his mother told him. First of all, she handed him a musket. But then after that, she said, quote, Never disgrace it, for remember, I would rather all my sons should fill one honorable grave than that one of them should turn back to save his life. Now, that's, that's pretty much, that says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> that's what I mean. And then she gave Sam Houston a gold ring and engraved on the inside of that gold ring was one word, honor. And he wore that ring the rest of his life. That tells the story. That part of the big part of the point I'm trying to make. So Sam Houston, how much time do I have? You've got about another twenty minutes. Oh my word. <laughs> okay. Well, I, okay then I can. No, I don't want to slow down, do I? <laughs> well, anyway, the next thing that happened to Sam Houston, and he goes off and fights at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814 under the very, very approving eye of Andrew Jackson, who was in command of the forces, combined regular and militia forces. At the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, 1814, fighting a combination of uh, British and Indian forces. So, at the early stages of the battle, Sam Houston has an arrow, a creek arrow, that goes into his thigh, barely missing major artery, going almost, barely missing the femur, the big bone up there. And so, at 19, well, he's 21 by this time, so at 21, he says to a fellow officer, he says, grab that arrow and yank it out. And, and the, so the fellow did. He grabbed it and he yanked it out of Sam Houston's thigh. Now back in those days, if you had a deep wound in your thigh, you were in for, you were in for one tough time. You could be. Well, Sam Houston goes back and as somebody bandages that wound, and then he turns around and leads a charge over the breastworks, and in leading that charge, he gets shot twice. He gets a musket ball into his shoulder and into his arm. Now, these were not the last wounds Sam Houston would receive. Some of, uh, most of you probably know, he was also wounded at San Jacinto. And, and Sam Houston, by the way, also fought a duel, although it was a bizarre set of circumstances. These were not the last wounds that Sam Houston would receive, but they may have cost him the most. And the reasons, reason is there are a lot of people who believe that his first wife, Eliza, who left him after only a few days of marriage, <laughs> believe that part of the reason that she may have been not wanting to stay with Sam Houston was that his wounds, even... This, and this marriage occurred 12, 13 years after he was actually wounded. He was still having um, fluids emerging from some of the wounds, especially in his shoulder. So, I mean, yes, I mean, you could understand. So, well, anyway, whatever Eliza's reasons for leaving Sam Houston, Sam Houston would never, ever allow anyone to say one word about her that was negative in his presence. 
And he took out an ad in the newspaper and told anybody who says anything bad about Eliza is going to have to answer to me. And so, as you might guess, that didn't happen much, <laughs> if at all. Now, I'm going to return to Sam Houston. I'm going to come back to him again, too, especially in order to revisit his reading of Homer and to explore how that experience might have made him different from other heroes of the Revolution uh, and how it probably helped him to come, in my opinion, the greatest figure in, in the history of Texas. But now, to the, now we're going to Goliad and we're going to the Alamo. It's, we're getting there. The Southerners at Goliad, including Colonel Fannin, who was the commander, he and his, most of his men were Southerners. He was from Georgia, shared these same romantic impulses. They wanted, to, they wanted to be heroes. They wanted glory. They wanted to be the ones whose mark was put down in the tablet of history, just as much as, maybe as much as Sam Houston. And I think he wanted to be passionate. I think he wanted to be headstrong, just like, say, Bowie, Jim Bowie and, and William B. Travis were at the Alamo. Uh, they were men, those were men that were truly of the age of, ro of romanticism, where no consequence mattered. Only thing that mattered was fighting and fighting with, for honor. That was the only thing. That, that was the thing that really mattered most of them. So now let me go back to the conversation that I kept wanting to try to hear in my head about Jim Bonham, the courier from the Alamo, the most famous courier of, from the Alamo, and James Fannin at Goliad. Let's go back to that conversation. I imagine that Jim Bonham, James Bonham, who as an attorney back in South Carolina, was very eloquent, logical, forceful, cogent, convincing, and trying to get James Fannin to take his men to march to reinforce the Alamo. So I think he was speaking with logic to be sure, but mainly from the heart and the spirit of the age, the passion of the age. And I think on the other hand, there was James Fannin struggling painfully to meet the demands of the age. And when Fannin later tried to act in the same sense of the age, the same spirit and passion, he didn't win glory that he and his men wanted so badly. His eventual effort to try to relieve the Alamo, and he did, most of you or some of you I'm sure know that, he did try at one point to march to reinforce the Alamo. But because they were convinced that they had to take so much artillery along with them in case the major Mexican force came up and they, the only way they felt they could protect themselves is if they had enough artillery. They couldn't get all the artillery across the San Antonio River. And they, they tried to get it across and then, they, and then finally the men voted that we're not gonna be able to go to the Alamo at this point. We need to go back and we need to regroup. And that was just the first in a series of extremely unhappy, ill-fated episode. Ill-fated is the term, by the way, that Sam Houston used to describe Fannin. Sam Houston described James Fannin as an ill-fated man, and he was, he was absolutely correct. Now, historians have faulted Fannin for, for this, but mainly, Mainly they have faulted him, especially people who look at the Texas Revolution only from a military perspective. They have faulted him primarily at a crucial point in March for splitting his force and causing delays in his leaving Goliad to join Sam Houston after the Alamo and, and combine forces with Sam Houston. Fannin divided his force. Now, he actually did that probably a day, maybe two days, before he got the order from Sam Houston. He had already, either, he had, and some of these things can't be known absolutely. He had already at least made, issued the order that I'm about to describe that he's criticized for in dividing his force. 
Now, why did Fannin divide his force? Well, blame it on men convinced that nothing, not military strategy, not the need to preserve the strongest Texan, Texian force in the field, not the biggest, but the strongest Texian force in the field, considering the weaponry and the ordnance they had. And surely not anything so trivial as orders. <laughs> military orders, I mean, military orders in the Texas Revolution is a, that, that's a, that's a contradiction in terms. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, they were military and yeah, they were or but they didn't have any meaning because most people ignored them. I mean, all the way up and down the line, it didn't matter. You know, at whatever level, they were generally just ignored. So that certainly didn't have anything. So why did he divide his force? And it was the, it was the chivalrous imperative, I argue, to march to the aid of a woman in distress. So I have sort of, I'm trying to get out of the weeds here. I'm trying to come back, I'm trying to make all the rest of that that I said earlier work out. And let me explain this. And this woman in distress was or was thought to be one Louisa Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S. And she was the wife of the tax collector at Refugio, her name, his name was Louis B. Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S, uh, who had left Refugio in, and left, he and uh, some other men had gotten caught up in various duties of the revolution and they had left most of the women and children in Refugio. Well, that's only 25 miles from Goliath, bear in mind. So Louis Ayers, when he realizes after Mexican irregulars had looted Refugio, he goes to Fannin and he says, Colonel Fannin, we have women and children 25 miles away. One of them is my wife. They have, somebody has to go down there and get them. And also, uh, another man who had joined Fannin's command was Amon B. King. And Amon B. King was a Kentuckian who had come to Texas, and he had been the marshal of Refugio, and he too had left Refugio, caught up in this zeal to, you know, go to the fight, but not thinking about, well, what's going to happen to the women and children and so on. Well, anyway, he and Fannin, he and uh, Louis B. Ayers prevail upon Fannin to order a force down there under King's command King was extremely, extremely hot-headed and vindictive, and he was out for blood because he took it personally, very personally, that these Mexican irregulars had looted his town, his village. And he was down there without, he was in a take-no-prisoners mode, as we might say today. And as I already said, typical of the Texas Revolution, this happened almost exactly at the same time as Sam Houston told Fannin to leave Goliad and join him in Victoria. Almost exactly the same time. Now I want to ask you a question. After all you've heard about Southern Romanticism, let me ask, what do you think William B. Travis would have done if he had been the commander at Goliad instead of the co-commander at the Alamo? <coughs> If he had had an urgent message that women and children were 25 miles away and they needed rescuing, do you think that William B. Travis would have sent a small, fairly small force down there to try to rescue these women? In my, to my mind, there's no question. To my mind, there is absolutely no question. He, yes, he would have. He would have divided his force. He would have sent men down there. I think that was, I think that the demand of the age and the whole code of honor that I've been talking about would have made it really impossible for a southern, especially a southern commander, as of course Travis was too from South Carolina via Alabama, to have ignored a plea to go to rescue women and children that were only 25 miles away. 
So, you know, it, again, back to the term all or it was all it all or nothing. I mean, you don't if something like that. You're if you, instead of thinking about what the practical choice is, you are only thinking about the code and what you've been born to to do, not what's practical. And you can express this in more dramatic in resonant language, not say all or nothing, you could also say victory or death. Those famous and very resonant words from the Alamo declared not only a determination to die honorably for a cause, but also declared, again, in the spirit of the age that these men were a part of, that really what mattered was the code. You know, fighting another day, joining up with Houston, maybe to have a combined force, brute reality, knowing you were going to be killed, none of this mattered in the face of the code, the rule, the code of honor. So, Fannin, however, after he divided his force, they got in trouble. The first force he sent down there, they got in trouble. So then he had to send another force to rescue the force that was supposed to rescue the women. So by now he's got about 100 men wandering around down there in the general vicinity of Refugio. And when he finally takes off to join Sam Houston, only a few miles out of Goliad, he runs into General Jose de Urrea, who was not in any way like Antonio Lopez de Santana. Jose Urrea was a real, real commander and a real soldier. And he, when he, Fannin ran into him on the prairie, Fannin's ammunition cart broke down. Uh, he's been criticized, rightly probably, for not trying to get to the creek in the shelter of the woods, but most people don't, re don't realize that he could have made it to the woods, but his bullets wouldn't have made it with him because they were all in one cart and that one of his very earnest and noble su subordinates had caused to be loaded with all the ammunition, thinking if they had a problem, everybody would know where it was, you know. Uh, but as it turned out, when that cart broke down, they were stuck out there in that prairie. Well, after a fight on March 19, 1836, the next day, Fannin has wounded people all everywhere. And he's out of ammunition, and his cannon have just about burned up, and he's, out of, he's pretty much out of, um, of cannon, of, of artillery balls as well. In the meantime, overnight, Jose Urrea has got reinforced with artillery, and he has the high ground. There's not much high ground out on those planes, but there's about five or six feet, and on and when you're dealing with, when you're in that situation, those are five, those are very important feet. He had artillery. So Fannin, who by the way was wounded in the, in the shoulder uh, and in the leg and another slight wound uh, on his hand while standing in the middle of the, circ the moving square that they tried to form standing up, straight up, saying, you know, do this, do this, and firing his weapon, and he had been wounded three times. They get up that morning, and uh, their, the Mexican artillery fires, uh, artillery rounds and, and chain shot, grape and chain shot, into the trenches, and, the, and, and it rips the trenches apart. Fannin's men, 60 of whom were wounded out of 300, and many and others with minor wounds, had no water, and their choice was this. There was not an effective fight left for these men. And not only Fannin, but these men hoped that they could find a way. The main problem was these wounded people, men. You know, the 240 men who weren't wounded could see themselves getting to the bushes 
but they couldn't see themselves running into the bushes and leaving 60 of their comrades lying out there on the field. And so Fannin and General Urea worked out a vague and much criticized surrender agreement. And in my opinion, the re what they were seeking to do was give Urea time to circumvent Santa Ana's orders that all prisoners be killed. It was thought that maybe Urea could work with people in the government. It was thought that I'm, Urea probably thought the revolution was going to be over because from his perspective, he was running, he was, he, he, he hadn't been stopped and he thought he was going to win, that the, the side was going to win. So they thought, we'll save them for now and then, then we can, they'll probably be okay. Well, we know now that that's not what happened, but I believe that both of these men deserve respect for trying to rise, at the, knowing how powerful the impulse was, for not only for Fannin, but for all those men, I mean, it's not just him, to, to join, really, with their comrades and, and, and hew hard to the code of victory or death in a way, in many ways, they would have, it would have been maybe the, even the easier thing to just say, let me, you know, let's bring it on. But I think that we, I feel that they deserve respect for trying to save lives. And I think they made what, when I say that I felt, I see in some of this dialogue between the Alamo and Goliad, a bit of the fading of one age departing and another age coming on. I think that Fannin and Urea made a 21st century decision, or a 20th century decision, as you will, on a 19th century battlefield. They made a deal. They were trying to do what probably most people would do now, but it was not in the spirit of their age. It was not, it was an embarrassment uh, in many ways that this occurred. And so it's a complex, it's a more complex series of events than we often think. So I would say that if the Alamo was a, a glorious sacrifice in the cause of freedom, then Goliad was a bold, risky gambit to try to save lives. And so when I think about Goliad 176 years ago now, I think about how terrible it was that about 342 men were brutally killed just outside the Presidio La Bahia at Goliad. And then I also think about how terribly, terribly sad and tragic it is that with all of the effort that went into trying to save these people's lives from both sides, and I am not making this up in order to be, you know, even-handed or however you want to look at it. There were people on both sides, several Mexican officers and soldiers, and the very, very well-known and real angel of Goliad, whose name was Francita Alaves, who saved several people herself from execution. In the end, actually, about 11% of Fannin's force was either spared by or hidden from the people ordered to kill them or, or they escaped when all the shooting started. So in the end, say 45 out of uh, almost around 400 people uh, did were either spared or escaped. It's not a total futile loss, but still the, the lingering sense of, you know, so much effort on both sides and, and one man was so insistent on making sure that these people were killed and that man was Santa Ana. So now I want to come back and I am I'm, uh, at the end of my formal presentation here. I want to return to Sam Houston again and I want to talk just a second about his fascination again with Homer's Iliad and I want to read the first two lines of Homer's Iliad. Quote, 
seeing goddess of the rage of Peleus's son Achilles, the great hero, Greek hero Achilles, the accursed rage that brought great suffering to the Greeks. For, and this is not Homer, this is me. It, I'm, you could tell the difference anyway. But. <laughs> For it was the rage and the impulsive actions of Achilles that led to even more killing of his own people, of the Trojans, of Hector, and then to the terrible destruction of Troy, and all because Achilles felt that Agamemnon had violated his honor. The noble Achilles, instead of placing the needs of his people first, nursed a very personal hatred, as did some of the people in the Goliad story. And thereby, Achilles lost his true honor. For true honor owes its first allegiance to something beyond the self. There's no real glory for the hero without this higher purpose. So it was that a young man from Virginia, Sam Houston, grown to early middle age, did not surrender to rage, impulse, or even pride, or follow his well-known personal siren song into more seclusion, even accompanied by resorting to the bottle. Sam Houston didn't do that. He endured insults from his own men, probably most of his own men, and more than hints at his lack of courage, in order to fight another day after the runaway scrape. And on that other day, April 21st, 1836, at the Battle of San Jacinto, we all know that Sam Houston and his force won a, a great victory. Here was a man who cared less for appearances than he did about himself and about what people said about him. Instead, he cared more for his country. Even the name Runaway Scrape tells you what people thought about Sam Houston at that time. Run away, scrape. Run away, you don't run away. That's not the code. Sam Houston, a romantic, yes, in many ways, but a romantic with the wisdom of the ancients fixed in his brain, mainly from his reading of Homer. A romantic who knew not only the greatness that individuals may achieve, but also the terrible consequences that often ensue when human passions rule. And after that day at San Jacinto, though wounded yet again, and serious, pretty seriously, he refused to let his passions control him then because he rejected the imprudent demands of his men to arrest or to execute Santa Ana. Now, by sparing Santa Ana, yes, there were problems down the road, but let's think about this. In sparing Santa Ana, Houston got a pledge from Santa Ana that all the Mexican forces in the field in Texas at that time, which far outnumbered Sam Houston's forces, he got a pledge from Santa Ana that all those forces would be withdrawn, and that meant that Sam Houston never had to fight Jose Urrea, who bitterly resented Santa Ana's order to withdraw. And Jose Urrea was a man who with a superior force might have changed the outcome of history. Thank you very much.